Today's scripture reading is found in Daniel, Daniel 7, chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. Daniel 7, chapters 9, or excuse me, verses 9 and 10. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days were seated. His garment was white as snow, and, their hair, and the hair on his head was pure like wool. His throne was a fiery flame, his wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand and thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were open. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Well, we're so happy to be with you guys again today. It's just really special to get to worship with um, our Adventist church family. And see you all again. So the song we're going to share this morning is, um, it applies all around the world, whether you live in Thailand or America, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, this song is for every single one of us. My worth is not in what I own, not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. My wealth is not in strength or name. In win or lose, in pride or shame. But in the blood of Christ that flows at the cross. I rejoice in my redeemer. trust in him no other my soul is satisfied in him alone as summer flowers we fade and die fame youth and beauty hurry by but life eternal calls to us at the cross. I will not boast in wealth or might or human wisdom's fleeting light, but I will boast in knowing Christ at the cross.
start off with an Ellen quote out of the book of Evangelism, and she says, the perils of the last days are upon us. And in our work, we are to warn the people of the danger they are in. Let not the solemn scenes which prophecy has revealed be left untouched. If our people were half awake, if they realized the nearness of the events portrayed in the Revelation, and I would say in Daniel, a reformation would be wrought in what? Our churches, if we understood how near the events were portrayed in Bible prophecy, there would be a reformation worked out in our churches, and many more would believe the message. So warning, preaching about prophecy, preaching about revelation, preaching about Daniel. As we look at Daniel chapter 7, it, can, it really consists of three parallel prophecies using the repeat and expand principle. So that's what we're going to be looking at today as we go through Daniel and see what it's telling us and let it talk to us. One night Daniel was sleeping, God gave him a, a vision, he records it and it says, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream telling the main facts. I saw my vision by night and behold the four winds of heaven were stirred up the great sea, were stirring up the great sea, sorry. And, our, and four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. And four beasts came up from the sea different from the other. The first beast was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till, it were, till its wings were plucked off. And it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man. And a man's heart was given it. And suddenly another beast, a second, like a bear, and it raised up on one side, and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. Lo, another, like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. And this I saw in the night vision, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong, it had huge iron teeth. It was devouring and breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. So the little horn plucks up three horns by the roots, it's a very interesting, as we take a look into the Hebrew on these words plucked up, it has a bit of a variety here. In the Brown Driver Briggs uh, Dictionary, it says to pluck, be rooted up, to be rooted up. In the Theological Word Book of the Old Testament, it's to be rooted up. The Aramaic verb referring to plucking up by the roots it refers to tearing something out, destroying it, pulling it out by the roots. It is used frequently of tearing out men or rulers, and that's a complete word study Bible. And this Hebrew word is used only here, one time in the Bible. Some say rooted up, uprooted. This one says tearing it out. There are some Bible translations that actually say that he uprooted the uh, three little horns, the other three horns. And... Here's what the Barnes commentary says. And I was reading Daniel. I had the commentary open. I looked over. And when I saw this, in the growth of that horn, three of the other were plucked up by the roots. The proper meaning of the word used to express this is that they were rooted out as a tree overturned by roots, or the roots are turned out from the earth. The process of which was done seems to be done by growth. The gradual increase of the horns so crowded out the others that a portion of them were forced out and fell. What is fairly indicated by this was not by act of violence or by sudden convulsion or revolution. When I read that, I said, this guy is crazy. 
I mean, they were ripped out. So I decided, well, okay, there's three places that talks about the little horn doing damage to those three horns. He plucked them out, subdue, and fell. I said, all three can have to be in harmony. So context, right? Context decides interpretation. So we'll look at this later as we get in here on this plucking out as we look at the other two, whether it was actually ripped out or whether they were forced out. And we'll see what this guy has to say. Uh, if what he says is true, that it wasn't by violence. It was that he thinks that the little horn was growing so fast that it's like a, a plant in a garden. He pushes out the other plants if it's too powerful. When I plant trees, I get a planting guide, and it tells you, you need to plant the trees what? Can I plant two apple trees five feet apart? What would happen? There'd be a battle over the roots, and uh, one of them may lose. So let's continue on here. I just want to put that out about the plucking up. And there, in this horn, were eyes, like the eyes of a man, a man speaking pompous words. So the little horn shows up, speaking pompous words, eyes like the eyes of a man. Let's take a look at the rest of this vision. And I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. So John, Daniel is saying one vision here. He sees the three come up, then he sees the fourth beast come up with the ten horns, the little horn, and now he's going in to more of the vision as he's progressing through. So I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a what? Fiery flame, its wheels a what? Remember that. We're coming back to that later, okay, to help us understand the timing of this prophecy. A fiery what? Stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was what? Seated, and the books were open. So we see a judgment scene happening here. Three beasts. We have the fourth beast, dreadful. The horn comes up, speaking pompous words. There's ten other horns. So what is John seeing in this part of the vision when the thrones are set up? He sees God the Father, or the Ancient of Days, sitting on that fiery, glorious throne. Daniel has shown the judgment in heaven. And it's interesting, as you look at Daniel 7, the judgment is really just the little horn. It's not the whole world. God's actually judging the little horn power and everything connected with it. So let's discover this judgment. So John sees the judgment, and then the very next thing he says, I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. So back in verse 8, he says the little horn was speaking arrogant, pompous words. He says, I watched then because of what that little horn was saying and speaking. Then he says, I watched till the beast was slain and the body destroyed and was given to the what? Burning flame. So the judgment that is set in heaven is here for the beast. And this beast was what? Slain. And his body destroyed and given to the what? Well, where do we see the burning flame earlier in the book? We see the God's throne. God himself destroys this little horn and the beast. So the beast is slain, the little horn is slain, and the ten horns are slain. It's one beast, and they're all slain. And we'll see that later here in Daniel. And we see that he's given to the burning flame and destroyed. So when something's burned up and destroyed, are they coming back? There's no healing of any wound when you're destroyed or burned up, right? So this is his obliteration or annihilation here. Is that what the Bible says? Burned up, is that what it says? Given to slain, its body destroyed, and everything connected with the body, and given to the burning flame. This is the Estee Bible commentary 
And uh, I decided I gotta start digging in into our commentary on some of these things. And I love, my, I love the Bible commentaries. Here's what it says for that verse. For this verse right here, I watched till the, the beast was slain. So this commentary on was slain. This represents the end of the system or organization symbolized by the what? Horn. So it's the end of that horn power. And it says here, Paul pre- presents the same power under the title, man of sin, son of perdition, that wicked and speaks of its destruction at the second coming of Christ. Second Thessalonians, that he would, this man of sin would be destroyed by the brightness of his what? Coming. We all know that. So the Bible commentary actually applies this fire to the uh, destruction of the little horn at this time in earth's history. Now here's the interesting thing, this next verse. As for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion what? Taken away. So he sees a fourth beast destroyed, but the other three, and it says their dominion was taken away. Let's take a look here. Another Bible, this is from the Bible commentary, and they actually give a dual fulfillment here. Uh, This is page 829. The territory of Babylon was made subject to Persia, yet the subjects of Babylon were allowed to live on. Similarly, when Macedonia conquered Persia, and when Rome conquered Macedonia, the inhabitants of the conquered countries were not destroyed. With the final destruction of the little horn, the what? The whole world would be depopulated. So they're actually realizing these countries absorb the other countries, but at this point in time, when the little horn is finally destroyed, the whole world will be, what? Depopulated, right? Where's the saints when Jesus comes? We're going up. What happens to the wicked? Yeah, they're destroyed. So very interesting, the Bible commentary, as I looked at that, was saying, okay, okay, they're honest. They're being honest. Where it says, let me go back a little bit here. It says, as for the rest of the beast." They had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a what? Time. So what Daniel is showing us, four beasts, judgment scene, the fourth beast is destroyed, that whole system, but what happens to the other three beasts? Yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. So, two takeaways. All four beasts were operating at the same time. They're not in succession one after the other. If the fourth beast is destroyed, how could the other three, if they had passed through, they had passed off the scene of history, how could their lives be prolonged for a season and a time? Set that, let that set in. So the fourth is the first one destroyed, and the other three prolonged for a short time. The New American Standard says that uh, they're prolonged for a uh, appointed time, a period of time. Some places like be like a short time. Now this first vision is in the time when the court is set, the books are opened, and the judgment is passed. What happens when the judgment is passed, the next scene? Let's see. Daniel will tell us. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near to him. Okay, Jesus comes before the Ancient of Days. Was that Ancient of Days the one sitting on the fiery throne? And why did Jesus come? And there, was, and there is given to Christ, or given to him as his dominion. We read, there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. So Jesus is setting up his what? His kingdom. So we see we have the four beasts, we have the judgment scene, 
The fourth beast is destroyed. The other three prolong for a short time. How short? Until Christ sets up his kingdom. So what we see here, we see end day events. The little horn, out of order. God takes action on him for his pompous words. God destroys him. The three beasts live for a short time, and then Jesus comes. So we have the second coming. We have the judgment and the destruction of the fourth beast here in the first part of the book of Daniel. Now, I said there's three parallel prophecies repeat and expand, so we need to see this again. How many witnesses do we need in the Bible to establish a matter? At least two, three, maybe even better. So Jesus is setting up his kingdom after the little horn is destroyed and after, uh, after the judgment. So Daniel says, I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Those great beasts which are four are four kings which arise out of the what? Out of the earth. Now, this next slide says, but the saints of the Most High shall what? Receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. So there's a contrast between those four kings going away and God's people what? Receiving the kingdom. So those four beasts all at the same time go off the scene. They lose, basically what it's saying here. The beast, the fourth beast and the other three, they lose. And what happens to God's people? We win. We win. So the saints overcome, and we see again another second coming scene is when we receive the kingdom. Now here's the second vision that starts up. Then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron, its nails of bronze, which devoured broken pieces and trampled the residue with his feet, and the ten horns that were on his head, and the other horn which came up, before which three what? Fell. The three fell. F-E-L-L. Now, that could have a lot of wide application. It could be tripping, stumbling, could be fell in war. Well, let's take a look at the Hebrew words. And according to Brown Driver Briggs, that's to fall, to fall down. The theological word book of the Old Testament is, is um, to fall, lie, be cast down, or fail. And the complete word study dictionary says an Aramaic verb meaning to fall, to prostrate oneself, or to die. So it's interesting, this word for fall, they fell before the little horn. It, it's one time in Ezra, translated something different than fell. Every other time, it's in the book of Daniel. So if we want to understand the context of this word fell, we need to see how Daniel used it in other places. Would that be? Because some people think that the three other, those three horns fell in war. But let's see how Daniel uses it and see if we can make it that it would be consistent through the book. Are you ready? So let's let Daniel speak. Let the Bible speak. And let's see where the word falls uh, in other places here. The Nebuchadnezzar fell on his what? Face. Prostrate before what? Daniel. So this word, what did Nebuchadnezzar do? He fell down before Daniel prostrate. Did Nebuchadnezzar, didn't Daniel knock him down? No, the king was overwhelmed, so he fell down on his face before Daniel and prostrated himself. In Daniel chapter, chapter 3, verses 5, 6, 7, verse 10, 11, 23, they all say about the same thing, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, you shall what? 
fall down and what? Worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. So here, they fell down and they were supposed to worship, being subservient to Nebuchadnezzar, acknowledging his power. Well, we know three men didn't fall down. They refused to fall. And then in chapter 3, verse 15, Now, if you are ready, at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the what? The image which I have made. Good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? So this vision of Daniel 7 is a parallel to another, uh, the vision of the three horns falling to a story, and that is Daniel chapter 3, when Nebuchadnezzar set up an image, and he told the people to what? Fall down and worship. That's what happened to the three horns, is they didn't fall in war, they actually fell in worship. And I'll demonstrate that here soon, because in the book of Daniel, there's another group that doesn't fall. Now, why am I saying this? Because all this is going to be reenacted again on us. That's going to be played out again in the last days. We're going to be facing this as a people. We're going to be forced to make a choice whether we're going to worship the beast or whether we're going to worship God. And the Bible doesn't paint a pretty picture of the pressure that's going to be put on us. So let's continue on here. So those three horns in Daniel didn't fall in war. They actually fell in worship. Now let me continue this, the vision here. That horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words whose appearance was greater than his fellows. So we see here the growth of the little horn is that it uprooted the other three horns. It didn't, it didn't destroy them. And I'll prove that here in a minute. Because if there's ten horns and three are destroyed, how many are left? Seven. Remember that. Seven. So basically what happened here is what happens when Walmart moves into a town and there's a Kmart. What happens to Kmart when the Walmart moves in? There used to be a Kmart over here. They were uprooted. And that's exactly what happened. It's, they, they fell because they couldn't stand up to the competition. The little horn was growing. It says uh, he was growing so fast. You know, his appearance was greater than his fellows that they just couldn't compete with him anymore. So basically, they were, they were rooted out. They were. They just couldn't compete. So what did they do? They had to bow down and say, you're greater than us. Then Daniel continues on. I was watching with the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing what? Against them. So the verse before this, the horns fell. That group fell in worship. The very next verse, here's the saints. And why is the little horn prevailing against them? Because what do they refuse to do? They refuse to fall. They're not going to bow. So there's a contrast between the three horns that fell in the saints. That the saints, even though the little horn's going to destroy them, kill them, they're not bowing. They're not bowing. You ready for the next verse? I'm going to read this one again. I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was made in favor of the saints of the what? Most High. So, has the judgment happened yet? Has, has it been given in favor of the saints of the Most High yet? No, this is still future. This is still future. This battle is still future. This is in the last days. 
probation closes here, the saints win, and then God executes the judgment, this time in favor of the saints. Earlier, he executed judgment against the little horn power. So, until the Ancient of Days came, and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to what? Possess the kingdom. So what do we see? We see a battle with the little horn. We see some falling. We see the saints refusing to fall. And then what does it say? The Ancient of Days came. This is a parallel to the first vision when the thrones were set up and the Ancient of Days came. But this time, instead of condemning, he is what? He's passing. Uh, the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. And he says that we are uh, passing in favor of the saints of the Most High. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. So we see a second coming, just like we did back in the first vision. So that ends the second vision. This verse begins the third vision. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the other kingdoms that shall devour the what? The whole earth. So when, does we have a, when do we have a power who's going to devour the whole earth? Has that happened yet? When? Who? Rome was European. Yes, this is talking about the whole world, Roger. Well, we just got a second coming scene, and we just got a judgment scene. That's clearly post, post papal Rome. The saints possessed the kingdom. That hasn't happened yet. The papacy never ruled the whole world. Rome didn't rule the whole world either. Well, we'll disagree agreeably on that. So, trample it, break it in pieces. And I believe that this is the time when we have the mark of the beast. And we'll continue on. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom, and another shall arise after them. So what is the source of the ten horns? Where do they arise out of? They arise out of the what? The fourth kingdom. They're not transplants in from another place. Daniel tells us exactly the origin of the ten horns. They come from the fourth kingdom. They're on his head. The little horn comes up. So they're not, they're not people who migrated in and... Uh, and took over, this verse is very clear. You can't really do much with it except take it at face value. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from, the, from this kingdom, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the first ones, and shall subdue what? Okay, so we had uprooted. I should say plucked up the roots, could be uprooted. Fell, fell in worship. So what does subdue mean? Well, let's take a look. According to the dictionary.com, subdue, to conquer, to bring into subjection, to overpower by superior force, to overcome. So it subdued three of them. Does subdue necessarily mean that you destroy somebody? It doesn't. Matter of fact, you can use to subdue, really, if you destroyed somebody. You destroyed them. Subdue is bring them into subjection, and they're what? They're obeying you. Well, let's see what the Hebrew word has to say here. This is a driver um, BDB uh, dictionary. It means to be or to bring low to humble. Then in, in America, a uh, Aramaic verb meaning to humble, to subdue, cle uh, complete word study dictionary. This is strong, expanded, to abase, humble, put down, subdue. Theological word book of the Old Testament, to low or humble. So this word subdue doesn't mean to destroy. It means to what? Bring them under subjection. So what happened? The little horn grew so big, he uprooted those three horns, he made them fall in worship, and he subdued them. He subdued them. Let's take a look here. At another one here. And we see there's a couple of translations, a Young's Literal translation, and three kings it 
humbleth, and that's the literal, Young's literal translation. The uh, New Revised Standard Version and the ESV, English Standard Version, and he shall put down three kings. Or, I like to say, he put them in their place. There's no place in the Bible where the fourth beast has less than ten horns. Are you with me? There's no place in the Bible anywhere where that fourth beast has only seven horns. Let's take a look. Daniel chapter 7, verse 7. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, it, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the other beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Daniel 7, 20. And the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn which came up, before which three fell. So here it has what? How many horns? Ten horns. I'm going to abbreviate some of these so I don't have to read the whole thing. Daniel 7, 24. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom. Revelation 12, 3. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and what? Ten horns and seven diadems on his head. We have Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and what? Ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. So the ten horns here have what on there? Crowns. So what does it mean when, when the crown is on? They've, they've come to power. Before, they didn't have the crowns. They were there. But now at this point in Earth's history, and by chapter 13, uh, those ten horns now have crowns, meaning they're reigning. Stay with me, because chapter 17 actually modifies this. Remember, they come to power here. Everything before in Daniel and Revelation 12, 3, there were just ten horns. Chapter 13 now ratchets it up. He gives a detail, right? Repeat and expand. So now he's expanding the ten horns. Now, all of a sudden, they have crowns. They've come to power. Chapter 17, verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and what? Ten horns. Verse 7. But the angel said to me, Why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carries her, which has seven heads and ten horns. Chapter 17, verse 12. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as what? As yet. And that's what we're seeing beforehand. Until chapter 13, they really hadn't received the kingdom. Chapter 13, they have the crowns on. It says there, the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have, not received, who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the who? With the beast. So here, John has shown that these ten horns, when they receive their crowns and their authority with the beast, and as kings with the beast, how long does it last? 1,260 years? I think one hour is pretty clear. It's a short time. The book of Daniel is not dealing with long ages. It's dealing with short times. It's dealing with the judgment, the thrones being set up, the little horn being destroyed, and the saints get the kingdom. It's repeated over and over in Daniel. It's dealing with the time of the judgment. And then in chapter 17, verse 16, and the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. There is nowhere in the Bible that the fourth beast ever has seven horns. It's not there. If three horns were plucked up, then somewhere there has to be a beast with seven horns. Those three horns fell in worship, 
and were subdued and uprooted by the little horn. They just couldn't compete. They were not annihilated or destroyed. Daniel doesn't prove it. The Hebrew words don't prove it. Daniel 7 is a book for our day. It's judgment scene after judgment scene after judgment scene. Second coming scene, saints inherit the kingdom, saints inherit the kingdom, Jesus gets the kingdom. It's our book. We need to take the book back. It's our book. We don't let the little horn define this book for us. So the little horn would change what? Times and laws. We're going to study that here in a second. Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary. Um, going back to chapter 13, verse 1, Ellen White makes a comment on chapter 13. The Sabbath question will be the issue in the great conflict in which all the world will be a part. This entire chapter is a revelation of what will surely take what? Place. And we believe that chapter 13 of Revelation and chapter 7 of Daniel are companion chapters. And they are companion chapters. But she's saying it belongs over there. And that's what Daniel is saying too. We need to let Daniel speak for himself instead of imposing our preconceived ideas on him. If you're having judgment scene after judgment scene, little horn destroyed, and the saints getting the kingdom and Jesus getting the kingdom, it's really only one time of earth's history. And chapter 17 says that the ten horns reign with the beast as kings for only what? One hour. So it can't be 1260 years. Why am I saying this? We have a monster coming on this planet. He has camouflaged himself by moving things around in the prophecies, trying to deflect the information that unmasks them for the ambush. There's a Pearl Harbor coming on this planet. There's going to be a, 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 a ambush of global proportions. And he's going to try to take us out. And we're not even prepared for it because we're not even looking for it. I don't think we understand what is going to happen once the beast really does come to power. It's going to be ugly. It's going to be violent. It's going to be vicious. Trampling the earth. Trampling the whole world. So this is, re- this is real stuff. Why am I giving these series? It's not to wear you out. Not to tell you everything you believe is wrong. To alert you there's more to the story than what we see. I mean, we went, through, we went through the remnant in Revelation, starting at chapter 22 to verse 1. There wasn't one saint seen or God's people seen. That was before 1844. Every one of the book of Revelation, every one of those scenes was an end time scene where God's people are predicted, are, are predicted here. Same thing with the altar of incense. We did chapter 13. Here we're going into Daniel. Daniel in chapter, Daniel 13 in chapter 7 of Daniel, Daniel's chapter 7, Revelation chapter 13, excuse me, are both parallel chapters. And Ellen White is so clear here. This entire chapter is a revelation of what shall take place. If chapter 13 is still future, chapter 7 is still future. And I can say chapter 7 is still future because it's a judgment chapter. It's dealing with the judgment and the reward. The little horn gets his reward, and we get our reward. Those rewards are still future. Now, if you want a reward, then you need to be faithful to God. That's the point I'm driving at. And I know I'm going through a lot of work. I'm not trying to wear you out. This stuff is not easy. But I want, as your shepherd, to put you in the best position possible if this beast power comes, we are ready, spiritually ready. And if we should die before that, we're spiritually ready. If you're ready for the beast and you die before the beast comes, you're all set, right? So that's why I'm trying, to, I'm not trying to stir the pot. I'm, I'm trying to honestly, because I love you, to try to let us look at the book and let it talk to us for what it says, Right? We need to let the book talk to us and not assume things. Uh, 
So this entire chapter, and that entire chapter has a 42 months in it. So if that's still future, that means a 42 months is still future. Then she has a quote, Revelation chapter 11 is still future. That has a 42 months in it too. Now the time, times, and dividing of time is here in Daniel, and we're going to see what's connected to the time, times, dividing of time. Because if the 42 months is still future, that means Daniel has to put the time, times, and dividing of time in the future too, right? They're all covering the same time period. So let's see as we move on here what Daniel does with the uh, uh, times, times, and dividing of time. This little horn shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change what? Times and law. So, he's intending to change times. It says here, the complete word study, that word for times, it's a specific time or a period of time. So what period of times is he trying to change? The judgment period of times and the second coming period of times. He's trying to send them all in the back. He's sending them back in their really future. He has changed the times. As a matter of fact, the one chapter that says he shall change the times, that's the one he's hard, he worked hardest on to distort and send in the past because that's the one that unmasks him for what he's doing. Bible prophecy is being fulfilled in this church today. We are fixing the times of the dragon that he has messed up the prophecies in the book of Revelation and Daniel. He sends them everywhere but where they belong. God wants us to understand these things. If you don't think I'm right, then you study them and come to your understanding. I think I'm right, but you study them. Well, here's the verse. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and what? Half a time. So now we know what the little horn is doing. He's persecuting God's people. The saints are in his hand. But how is God responding to the attempted change of his prophetic times, his law, and the persecution of his saints? So what happens at the end of the times, times, and dividing time? So it ends at that times, times, dividing a time, right? He's limited. It's not unlimited. So he has a time, he's going to persecute the saints, and then it ends. What's the next event that happens when the time, times, dividing a time comes? But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion, and consume and destroy it unto the end. This is parallel to the second vision and the third vision. So when the times, times, dividing a time ends, God destroys the little horn. We win. That's what the book of Daniel is trying to say. Hold the line. Don't be subdued. Don't fall. Don't let him push you out. Stand like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Daniel chapter 3 is played out in living people like we see here in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel puts it in prophecy for the end days, but we already saw this all before in chapter 3. We're not going to bow. We aren't bowing. King, we don't need a second chance. We don't need to be politically correct. We're not bowing to your image. So it's clear. Then the saints should be given to his hand for a time, times, and half a time. And what happens when, the half a, when that time is done? But the judgment shall sit. This is the same judgment scene that we have already seen in the book of, uh, book of Daniel. This is the same scene. This, these are repeat and expand we have multiple witnesses that these are for our day. How many judgment scenes does God have to give and second coming scenes does he have to give in a chapter of the Bible we, before we get it? He's beating us over the head. I'm not beating you over the head. He is. Guys, bing, bing, judgment, bing, wake up. That's what he's saying. Take the scales off your eyes. Ask for the eye salve so you can see. So, God put it in there three times for a reason 
because he knew he needed three times to get through to us. This is, book is for your time. This, the saints should be given to his hands for a time to buy time. That's us. He's going to be taking us on. And the next scene is the judgment. God's going to destroy him. So God executes judgment on the little horn, and he doesn't receive a deadly wound. He's completely, irreversibly consumed, destroyed until the end. He's completely wiped out. At the end of the 1260, whatever we want to call it, he's destroyed. Revelation chapter 13, 42 months. Revelation chapter 11, 42 months. And here we have the 1260 days, and at the end of 1260 days, he's destroyed until the end. Now if he's destroyed, what should be the next scene we see? To be consistent with the other, with the other prophecies within Daniel, well, I'll show you. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is a what? Everlasting kingdom. We see it over and over and over. God wants us to win. He wants us in his kingdom. We are now without excuse for the devil to harpoon us. To come upon us aware. We know from Daniel Revelation that we need to be preparing for an onslaught. Some of us are going to die. Some of us are going to die for our faith. Others of us will be persecuted and we'll be out in the wilderness, cold and hungry. But that's only for a short time. It says the ten horns are ruling with the beast for one hour. When they receive their kingdom, it's a short time. But we need to hold on when that storm hits. Hold on for all we have. So the kingdom shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall what? Serve and obey him. That is a contrast with what the little horn wanted. The little horn wanted, wanted all dominions to what? serve and obey him. Little horn wanted his kingdom, but that's not going to last. God's kingdom lasts forever. The little horn wants to change times, but Daniel chapter 2 says, who holds the times? Who holds the destiny of the earth? Who's in control of what's going on? God holds the times. God holds the times, and that's why we serve him, because he's in control, his kingdom wins, and we will win. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall what? Increase. Bible prophecy is being fulfilled in this church. The knowledge of the book of Daniel is increasing. People of the end days, according to this prophecy, we should have more knowledge of the book of Daniel than our forefathers. Right? But we want it to be biblical. And that's what I'm trying to be. And I hope I am. I'm trying to be biblical. So here's how this works out. It's in 457 B.C. That was the beginning of the 490 years. It ended in 34 A.D. with the probation of the Jews closing at the stoning of Stephen. That's the 2300-day timeline. I'm tied into that. I really believe that timeline is solid. At the 34 AD, the book of Daniel was sealed. Actually, it was closed and it was locked. That's what basically what happened to the book of Daniel. It had nothing to say at all until the angel of Revelation 10 came down and the book was opened. In the angel of Revelation 10, we say that was in 1844, the book was opened. Now, at that point, the book has something to say to the earth because it's not dealing with the Jew, probation of the Jews. It's dealing with probation of what? The world. So the prophecies of Daniel are prophecies for those living in the last days. It's an end-day book. It's a book of prophecy. Daniel's speaking to us. Daniel 7's our book, that chapter. Daniel 8 Eleven, twelve. Those are our books. The 42 months, the 1206 days, and time times, the divine time, they fall after 1844. 
Jews, they were tested on the 490 years, failed. They failed. They were tested on time. Jesus came and said, the time is fulfilled. Repent and believe the gospel. He was a Nazareth. He read the book and he said, today this prophecy is what? Fulfilled in your hearing. What did they want to do? They wanted to kill him. They missed out their, their, their day for them to get right with God. In 1844, they missed it too. They were being tested on Daniel 8.14. That was their test in the book of Daniel. So the Jews were tested on the 70-year, the, the Millerites, early Adventists, they were tested on the 2300 days. We're being tested on the 42 months, the 1260 years, time, times, are dividing a time. We, we have a test too. Do we believe that these prophecies here are for us, or do they go back? I think, they, I think that's our test on time. This is uh, Ellen White, manuscript 176, and she says here, the time has come for Daniel to stand in his lot. The, the time has come for the light given him to go to the what? To the world as never before. That means the whole world. The light given to Daniel goes to the whole world. If those for whom the Lord has done so much will walk in the light, their knowledge of Christ and the prophecies relating to him will be what? Greatly increased as they near the close of earth's history. We should be seeing a great increase of the knowledge of Daniel and Revelation. Amen? Amen. I'm doing my little part here in Raleigh, Tennessee to help increase that knowledge. So... I'm going to stop this series now, probably until October. You guys have been drinking from a fire hose, so I need to let it rest. And uh, I want to do the seven churches, and uh, then another one is quick, short, near at hand. Look at the time, the timing within the book of, of Revelation to see the, how long and expansive those are and how uh, John uses them. So we need, honestly a knowledge of Christ and the prophecies relating to him, and we greatly need to be increased as we near the close of verse history to really understand these prophecies. God gave them to us. God gave the book to Jesus. Jesus gave the book to the angel. The angel gave the book to John, and who did John give the book to? Us. It's our book. I know I've said this before. We need to take it back from the little horn. It's our book. God gave it to us. He stole it. We've got to take it back. And how do we take it back? By interpreting the prophecies properly. Taking the book back. And put the timing of these prophecies where the Bible puts them. And interestingly enough, before Ellen White died, she fixed it. She left it for a future generation that she knew would come. And she left those nuggets there. And uh, she left the nuggets in, in her writings that these things were still future. She didn't make a big deal out of it. She did write it. I know of no one refuting what she has written. When she puts the seals in the, in the future, the trumpets in the future, chapter 11 in the future, chapter 5 in the future, chapter 13 in the future. I, don't, I haven't read anybody refute those. I don't think Adventists would really dare if we believe she's a prophet. Because that would cast serious doubt on her, on her prophetic gift if she, if she was wrong. Right? we got the Bible, and we have the spirit of prophecy guiding us. If you want the quotes from Ellen White, my email, I believe, is on the back of the, uh, of the bulletin. Or send me a text on my phone. I'll send you those. I have given them to people here already. I'll give them to anybody who wants it. And you can read what Ellen White has to say for our guest. We believe Ellen White was a pioneer of our church, and she had a prophetic gift to help guide us. She didn't replace the Bible. She just helped us get back to the Bible and understand it better. So if you want those quotes, I'll give them to you. It's only about five, six pages, not a lot of reading, where she talks about the prophecies in Daniel and Revelation being in the future. Let's have our closing hymn.